day. And are you ready for a little Bible trivia? We'll play a little game here. I have a City Point patch, leather patch. I've got a couple of versions of these and a keychain that is available for you to win. There's only seven questions, but you have to get all seven right. And for those of you who have already been privy to these answers, just by being privy to the answers disqualifies you. You're not qualified. So for most of you, you can, uh, this, is, this is it. You're ready? You're, are you ready? All right. So Bible trivia question number one. What are the names? No, you just have to, this is an honor system. You don't shout them out. You just kind of write down, put a little mark on your notes to say, yep, I got that one right. And if at the end you have seven marks, you're a winner. Okay, so Bible question, trivia question number one. What are the names of the two first human beings? Now that's fairly basic. Can't say that I would have known that prior to um, like the age of 19 when I first came to Jesus, but maybe you know that. It's Adam and Eve, of course. So did you get it right? Okay, mark your thing. All right, next question. Where in the Bible does it say cleanliness is next to godliness? If you just reference the book, that's fine. You don't have to have to have, to have chapter and verse. If you wrote nowhere, you're correct. That is not actually in the Bible. It's not bad counsel, but it's not inspired of God. Okay, number three. How was it that Noah and his family survived the flood? Fairly well-known story. If you wrote the ark or something like that, a large barge, that would qualify as well. You get it. You scored. Okay. Of the 12 disciples, which one formerly worked for the Roman government? If you wrote Matthew, you're correct. He was the tax collector for the Roman government. All right. Next question. In which of the books of the Bible is the saying, to, the, to thine own self be true? It sounds like it maybe could come from Proverbs, but if you wrote none of them, you're correct. That's not in the Bible. In fact... That came from Shakespeare, I believe, and in fact, it's pretty much the mantra of our modern-day culture and is quite antithetical to Scripture. And some of us are so entrenched in our own culture that we don't recognize that that is a contrary concept when it comes to the way we're supposed to live our lives. We're not called to be true to ourselves. We're called to be true to God, right? Difference. Okay, next, number six. There are only two birthdays celebrated, mentioned in the Bible. Whose birthdays were celebrated? You could, you, if you remember last week's sermon, if you were here or participated online, you've got one of them. Herod the Tetrarch is one of them. Who's the other one? That would be... Somebody's thinking, is it Jesus? No, it's not. It's not. We celebrate it as a birthday, but it's not celebrated as a birthday in the Bible. It's Pharaoh. Back in Genesis, when Pharaoh and his cupbearer and his baker, they were in prison, and Joseph was with them, and they celebrated his birthday, and et cetera, et cetera. All right, so last one. I wonder, has anybody got all, all six so far? Anyone, if you're not going to admit it? Nobody? Okay, now admit it. Do you have all six? Nobody. How about online? You can, you can make some comments on Facebook if you want. Tell us how many you've got. All right, so here's the last one, and this is like maybe the toughest one. Of all Jesus' miracles, only two of them are recorded in all four Gospels. Which two? You should have thought the resurrection is in all four Gospels. That's one of Jesus' miracles that's recorded in all four Gospels. What's, what's the other one? And 
if you were reading ahead, like we like to say, read ahead, get your mind, your soul prepared for the sermon, you would have read it in this week's text. It's the feeding of the 5,000. Interesting, isn't it? Of all of the miracles, the feeding of the 5,000 is the one, other than the resurrection, that is recorded in all four Gospels. That's interesting to me. That makes me pause and think, why is that? We, we would know that all of Jesus' miracles were significant. In fact, John says that Jesus did a whole slew of other things, miracle, miraculous things that aren't recorded in the Gospels. So the ones that are recorded in the Gospels are all important. There's all the significance to them. And I wouldn't, I'm not, you know, purporting to think that, um, or for, for us to think that because the feeding of the 5,000 is recorded in all four Gospels, it's four times more important than all the other miracles. That's not what I'm saying at all. But we would, I don't think we would be wrong to think maybe there's some significance to that. Maybe there's a reason for this miracle to be recorded in all four Gospels, and that's what we're going to discover today, okay? We're going to talk about why that is. This is a famous account in this sub-series called Famous, and so it's familiar to many of you, but let's read it so that we are fully grasping what's taking place, and then we'll work through our text, starting in verse 13. Chapter 14 of Matthew's Gospel, starting in verse 13. Now, when Jesus heard this, He withdrew from there in a boat to a desolate place by himself. But when the crowds heard it, they followed him on foot from the towns. When he went ashore, he saw a great crowd, and he had compassion on them and healed their sick. Now when it was evening, the disciples came to him and said, This is a desolate place, and the day is now over. Send the crowds away to go into the villages and buy food for themselves. But Jesus said, They need not go away. You give them something to eat. And they said to him, We have only five loaves here and two fish. And he said, Bring them here to me. And then he ordered the crowds to sit down on the grass, and taking the five loaves and the two fish, he looked up to heaven and said a blessing. And then he broke the loaves and gave them to the disciples, and the disciples gave them to the crowds, and they all ate and were satisfied. And they took up 12 baskets full of broken pieces left over, and those who ate were about 5,000 men besides women and children. So we have this account that is uh, recorded, as I say, in all all four Gospels, the feeding of the 5,000 with just a handful of small loaves of bread and a couple of fish. And we know if we're people of faith, and if you're not a person of faith and you're just exploring the teachings of the Bible or this person known as Jesus Christ, if you're, if you're just in that investigative state, I welcome that. We as a church welcome that and pray that you're just able to process and take in what you, what you can here and, and may God lead you in that. But for those of us who are people of faith, this is a story, this is a story an account of, of one of Jesus' miracles that's pretty, com- pretty well known. It's a, it's a famous account. And there's, there's things for us to learn here that I think there's nothing that's recorded in the Scriptures that's really incidental, meaning it's, it doesn't carry weight. All of it matters. Even the order in which things happen matter. The order in which they're recorded matter. So let's take the scene. It opens up with Jesus wanting to get away. He wants to be alone. And he finds out, because he found out that John the Baptist, who was his cousin, uh, the forerunner of his ministry, we noted last week that Jesus is the one who said John the Baptist is the greatest, the last and greatest of all of the Old Testament prophets. And John the Baptist has just been executed by Herod the Tetrarch. And when Jesus hears this, as it says in verse 13, when he heard this, he wanted to get away. He wanted, to, he wanted to find a remote place, a desolate place where he could be by himself. Now, when he says by himself, we do have to recognize that, especially we, we know this to be true because in the other accounts, in the other gospel accounts, the disciples are with him. We know it here that they're with him, but he's getting away to a remote place by himself with his disciples. And here's what we see. Matthew purposefully tells us as the scene opens 
that it was Jesus' compassion for others that was a counterbalance to his own desires. That's number one. That's the first thing we see in these verses. He hears about his cousin who's been executed. We, we could speculate a bit here and think oh, for sure he's grieved by this. For sure there's a sense of, of um, shock and, and mourning that he's, that he's going through in this. It could also be that he's beginning to see the shadow of the forthcoming cross begin to form here, and he's recognizing that he's going to pass through the courts of Herod himself uh, in not, not very long. And, and so there's a lot probably that Jesus is processing. There's a lot of things that he's going through in this moment. And so he wants to withdraw. He's been with crowds. He's been doing thing, teaching and doing miracles. And it would just be nice to be by himself for a little bit, as it seems Matthew is telling us. So he gets in a boat, and he's on the Sea of Galilee, and he's going to go to a place that's not populated. It's a desolate or a remote place, and he and his disciples are sailing away, but the crowd on the shore sees them, and they recognize Jesus and his disciples, and of course, because he is who he is, and people are attracted to him, and on our, it's a magnificent you know, ministry that he's been running, and, 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 and so they follow him on shore. So the boat's traveling down the lake, and they're following on the lake shore. And in fact, Matthew tells us that they got there before Jesus did. And so when he shows up, here he was hoping to be by himself, but he's facing a crowd of people that are, they have needs. And so Jesus' compassion, Matthew tells us, is a counterbalance. It, it's, an, it's something that is an offset to his own desires. So a counterbalance is um, like a forklift is a really good illustration of a counterbalance. Something that's, something, this great big load that's in the front of the, uh, in the front of the forklift is offset. The load is offset by the weight of the forklift itself. The base of the forklift is actually, for this, for its size, is very heavy. And it's, and it's an offset. So it counterbalances the load. So when we say Jesus' compassion, his compassion for other people, his compassion for the needs of others was a counterbalance to his own desires, he, he, had, he, he wanted to get away, right? To be by himself. And, and the presumption is, and I think it's a fair presumption, that is that there's, there's a sense of grief. He's, he's mourning the loss of his cousin. So he's He's personally hurting and feels that he has his own desires, his own needs, but then there's the needs of others that act as a counterbalance to that. His compassion offset his own desires, and he healed their sick, we're told. We, we see this as the, the very makeup of who Jesus is uh, because when it's in the most critical, most gut-wrenching, physically agonizing part of his ministry when he's facing the cross, we see this, so this same sort of counterbalance or offset where Jesus clearly does not want to go to the cross. In fact, he's praying earnestly to his father in the Garden of Gethsemane for another way so that he does not have to endure the cross. And yet he comes to the conclusion, there is no other way, so therefore he says, nevertheless, not my will, but your will. There's a counterbalance here. The book of Hebrews says it like this, that we're to look to Jesus, the founder and perfecter of our faith, who, catch this, for the joy that was set before him endured the cross. There's the offset. He endured the cross. He did what he had to do on the cross because of the joy that was set before him. The joy of growing the family of God. The joy of rescuing people from their own personal demise and, and, and granting them eternal life. The joy that was set before him was the offset to the endurance that he had, what he had to put up with in going to the cross. We see this as part of Jesus' makeup. Our need to have our sins atoned for, our need for rescue was that counterbalance to his own personal desires. 
and he willingly went to the cross. And friends, this is, so, so as followers of Christ, then we're supposed to watch Jesus, observe Jesus, learn his ways, and incorporate them into our own lives. And the more we do that, the more mature we are in our walk with Christ. God is forming the image of Christ in us by his grace, through the work of his Holy Spirit and his word, as we learn and apply, learn and apply. So what do we see here? We see Jesus has wants and he has a will. And when his wants don't line up with his will, he goes with his will, not his wants. He wanted to get away to a desolate place, but he has compassion on people, and so he enacts his will instead of his wants. He wanted there to be another way other than the cross, but because there was no other way, his compassion for us offset his wants, and he enacted his will. Right? That's important for us to grasp. Right? As followers of Christ, we follow his lead by being compassionate toward the needs of others and not just satisfying our own desires. Matthew includes this in the gospel, and I think the other gospel writers include this in there. We're, we're beginning to understand why is this included in all four Gospels? This is a bit of it, friends. This is part of this. Jesus is training his disciples. He's doing something for the crowds, no doubt. He's having compassion on them, healing their sick, but he's training his disciples. And in fact, he's training his disciples today in this moment. He's helping us to understand what it means to follow him. I was thinking about the the nature of the church and the, the reality of the church running, functioning, and moving forward in its mission only because people sacrificially give, serve, volunteer to do whatever it is on a week-to-week -week basis and special events and different things. And the, there's, the church simply could not function without a myriad of volunteers, mostly the super, super majority being volunteers. And I was thinking about, you know, the reality is if you were to have an honest conversation with every single person who volunteers, whether this morning or any other time, and to say, are there things going on in your life that could have prompted you to say, I'm not serving? I, I don't. I'm going through something personal. My family's going through something. There are burdens. There's heartaches. There's busy schedules, etc. Is there, are there things that would keep you from volunteering? And, and i my guess is every single person would say, yeah, yep, I just, I just do it because this is really important. I do it, I want, there's times I want to do something else, but I know the, the mission of Christ through his church is very important. And those people who do it like that are exercising or, or displaying a level of maturity that is that the rest of us should aspire to because they're following Jesus' lead in that. He has compassion. It's a counterbalance to his own desires. Here's one that is, th th this one is painfully, um, how do I say, painfully prevalent? How about that? Um, wearing a mask. Wearing a mask in public. Uh, you go into the grocery store, they kind of make you do it. I go into any other, you know, restaurant, whatever, you're supposed to put it on, keep it on until you're sat down, all of that sort of stuff. And then we come to the church, and it's like, man, could we just have a little freedom? And I, I don't disagree with you. Could we just have a little freedom? My guess is most of us would really like to not have our masks on, even right now. But because of the nature of things, the well-being of others, and even the regulations, um, we just keep our masks on, even when we're seated, because that's what's supposed to happen, and that's what's required. And it's, it's, a, little, it's a little old, isn't it? feels a little old. But we're, we, we, we can't relax our standards on that. Um, and so 
your compassion for others should be the offset uh, for your desire to take your mask off. And other people are showing up because they've heard that we are being careful with COVID-19. And, and so when you take your mask off, they say, I'm not coming back because they're not being careful. So this is my very, very kind and compassionate way of saying, you got to keep your masks on, even right now. Philippians 2.4 says, let each of you look not only to your own interests, but also to the interests of others. So again, it's your want, your desire versus compassion for others. Romans 15.1, we who are strong have an obligation to bear with the failings of the weak and not to please ourselves. The failings of the weak there really is about somebody who has a hypersensitive conscience. If somebody has a very hypersensitive conscience in ways that are not directly related to the scriptures, it's they're weak in their faith. Their, their conscience is not yet lined up to Scripture. And any of us who are strong in our faith, we don't look down on them. We're told we who are strong have an obligation to bear with them. To bear with really actually means to put up with, right? We put up with that and not please ourselves. That's what we're called to. And so Jesus' compassion here, as we see this, it's a counterbalance. He wants to get away, but these, these needs are here and they're present, and, he, and it's a counterbalance. It's, it's, it doesn't mean he doesn't take care of himself. It just means that he's got others in mind. We don't look out to our, for our own interests, but all, in other words, our only our own interests, but also the interests of others. And that's what we're called to. That's what we see in these verses. Now, when we get into verses 15 through 18, the disciples struggle initially, but they finally come to the place where they bring what they have to Jesus. So that's number two. Let's, let's read verses 15 and 16. So it says, now when it was evening, so it's the end of the day, right? The disciples came to him and said, this is a desolate place and the day is now over. Send the crowds away to go into the villages and buy food for themselves. <laughs> Now, if you've been around for a while, you've heard sermons on the Sermon on the Mount, the, I mean, not Sermon on the Mount, on the feeding of the 5,000, um, you, you probably have heard messages where the teacher or the preacher at this moment begins to disparage the disciples for being selfish, for, for being uncaring. But as I read this, I don't, I don't necessarily see that. Maybe it's true, but I don't necessarily see that. I see these I see these disciples as uh, they're probably also grieving. John the Baptist was somebody that was dear to them as well. So there's also, they're probably also grieving a bit. Um, it is the end of a very long day and a very taxing day of ministry. So they're tired. They traveled in a boat for a good distance. Now they've been serving the needs of these people as Jesus is bringing, uh, you know, healing these folks. So this is, a, this is the end of a long day. These guys are tired. So I don't, I don't see them as necessarily being selfish or uncaring here. I see them as being human. As humans, we have a limited amount of energy, a limited amount of, you know, time and strength and all of those things. And I see these guys, it just seems like a natural thing. Well, Lord, you've done what you could. You've had compassion. You've conducted some healings. Uh, and, so, and so I think it's, let's call it, Lord. You've done a great job today, and we're glad to have been partnered up with you. And so let's go ahead and call it. We'll send these folks home, and, and, that'll, and that'll be that. Sounds like a good plan, right? I mean, I think my, I'd probably come up with that plan. I'd think that was a pretty, pretty solid plan. But, but like a good coach, remember, this is all about Jesus training his disciples to carry on his mission once he's gone. And so, and so like a good coach, Jesus is going to get out of these disciples more than they thought they had in him. We, we only are able to push ourselves so far, but a good coach can push us just a little bit farther and get something out of us that is that is, we didn't even know was there. And, of course, that's how we, that's how we grow and that's how we get strong. That's, that's, how a, that's how a good coach builds champions. They push them just a little bit further than they think they can go. And Jesus is training good disciples then and now, and he's going to push us a little bit further than we think we can go like a good coach. The same compassion, in fact, that he had on the crowds because they had needs 
is the same compassion that would push us further than we think we could go. It sounds, it sounds kind of harsh. I mean, who hasn't had a coach that pushed him that you didn't hate in the moment? Jesus knows what he's doing in our lives, friends. He knows what we can and can't handle, and he knows what we need to do and what we don't need to do. And so they come to him and say, hey, send the crowds away, and Jesus says, no, 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 no. No, guys, let's, let's process this for just a minute. We're in a desolate place, and these people have been here all day long, and they're hungry. And so we have not yet exhausted. You might be exhausted, but we have not yet exhausted our compassion for these people. So rather than send them away, here's an idea. You give them something to eat. And at that point, of, of course, the disciples are, are, are thinking, uh, once again, Lord, the Lord surprises them. They're, and they're like, what do I do with this? What, what do I do with this? <laughs> they're, they're probably thinking, Lord, we, we were on the boat with you. You know, you know we didn't bring truckloads of bread and fish over with us. You know, we're, we're like them. We don't, ha- we don't have anything. In fact, the only thing they had, they got from a little boy. According to John's version of the gospel, of, of this account, the only thing they had, they got from a young boy who evidently donated his lunch, five small barley loaves of bread and two fish. And so you see the disciples, verse 17 It says, they said to him, we have only five loaves here and two fish. And I want you to notice, it's they said to him. So this isn't a knee-jerk reaction from one of the disciples who pipes up instantly like Peter did so often. This is like a collective response to what Jesus, it's like Jesus says, no, you give them something to eat. They have a quick huddle like, what are we going to say to that? And they decide we're going to respond and say, we have only five loaves here and two fish. And what does Jesus say? Bring them to me. So there's this, there's this single line in, an, in a, uh, a, a discourse that the Apostle Paul, it's almost like he's trying to have a dialogue with him where he's posing questions and knowing that they're going, to fabri- they're going to manufacture an answer in their minds. In, 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 his, in his letter to the Corinthian church, he asks them probing, intriguing questions, wanting them to think deeply about something. And at one point, in order to, because they were very, um, very spiritual people, and uh, many of them were well off, and, uh, and, and so he, he poses this question in order to quell their own pride, and help them to recognize a, a, a truth that, that they needed to get, he asks them this question. He says, what do you have that you didn't receive? And we could pause and think about that for just a moment, couldn't we? What do we have? What do I have that I didn't receive? What do you have that you didn't receive? And I don't mean that everything we have somebody gave to us for Christmas or for our birthday, but what do you have that you didn't receive? If we think, if we think deeply enough about that, we must all come to the honest conclusion that everything we have has been given to us. The idea that we're a self-made man or a self-made woman and we earned our way and all of those things. Working hard and being diligent and being productive is a part of what's supposed to be for humanity. So you've done what you should have done in that. And that, that's not to be, I'm not making light of that. I'm just, just the reality of your intellect, your physical strength, and everything else, you didn't, you didn't come up with that yourself. It was given to you. And everything that you did with your intellect and your physical strength, etc., everything has been, is, comes back to, what do you have that you didn't receive? Every single thing we have, we received. And so it's like this is case in point with the disciples 
where Jesus says, you give them something to eat. And they say, well, we only have five fish or five loaves of bread and two fish. And a little boy gave it to us. That's all we have. Everything they have, they received. And what does Jesus say? Bring them here to me. Okay, so in the first sense, we understand as we're learning and trying to be trained in how how to follow Jesus, we understand that Jesus is compassionate. And even when he has desires and needs that would, would pull him another direction, his compassion for others compels him to act on mission. And we're learning that. We need to be learning that. Here, Jesus is teaching us something in addition. He, from his, he's teaching his disciples and likewise us. He's teaching us that whatever we have, we, we need to bring it to Jesus. We don't just keep it to ourselves. We need to bring it to Jesus. So now this is where Jesus gets his disciples to where he needs them to be. Again, like a good coach. Before a good coach works in such a way as to bring out of his or her athletes what they, or athletes, could be executives, whatever, what gets out of them what they didn't even know they had in them, right? Here, a good coach brings a person or their team or whatever to a place, brings them to a place that they need to be in order to learn what they need to learn. You ever see the show Remember the Titans? That's a classic show with Denzel Washington, the racial tensions going on in the early 70s, the desegregation and uh, desegregation of schools and all of this tensions taking place, and he's trying to get his football team to come together. There's black people and there's white people, and they've never played together before, and he's trying to get them together, and he takes them away for this week of camp, and he's working them to, to death nearly, and at one point he gets them up in the middle of the night and for a middle-of-the-night run, and they run all the way. They have no idea where they're running or how far they're running, but they're all dog tired, and they end up just at the very dawn of the day at Gettysburg. And he makes note that what was going on on that battlefield 150 years prior is the same junk that they're fighting in the 1970s. And he says, if we don't come together, then these people died for in vain. And you think about where we're at as a country right now. And friends, the 19, what was going, what, the era that that movie was made in was almost 50 years ago. And here we are still. It's like Jesus is wanting to bring us to where we need to be so that we can learn what we need to learn. And I hope we can learn something. He needs to instill this principle in us, friends. This is the principle. Whatever we have, we need to bring it to Him. Whatever we have, we need to bring to Him. So Jesus got them to this place that He wants them to be so He can teach them what they need to learn. And then, notice, it's not incidental. The order is important even It's then that Jesus does what only he can do. And when Jesus does what only he can do, everyone is satisfied and there's leftovers. So we've got this this passage. Look at verse 19 is really where things happen. And and three things have to happen that are recorded in verse, verse 19. First, it says that he ordered the crowds to sit down on the grass. If you read the other gospel accounts, Mark in particular says that he ordered them to sit down in the grass in groups of hundreds and fifties. So it's not just this random group, like 5,000 plus people. In those days, when he says 5,000 men besides women and children, in those days, in that culture, men and women did not eat together in public. That was kind of a taboo thing. And the children ate with the women. So you've got 5,000 men in groups of hundreds and fifties, and then the women and children, presumably also in groups of hundreds and fifties, and everybody's going to eat. So they're not, it's not just this mass spattering, smattering of people out on these 
grass fields there in groups so that they can be served well. Now imagine someone in the crowd who's against organized religion. You hear that a lot, right? I'm against organized religion. I'm hungry and I want Jesus to meet my needs, but I want my needs to be met on my terms in a more organic way. What would Jesus say to that person? He would order them with the rest of the group to sit down in groups of hundreds and fifties. Otherwise, they're probably going to go hungry, right? This word order is actually a command. He's commanding them to do this. And if they don't want to do that, well, then I guess they're not hungry enough. Interesting, isn't it? If you want your needs met, you have to do what Jesus tells you to do. That seems simple enough. And Jesus is telling them to get organized, to plan, to, to have, have some structure. So that's the first thing I see in verse 19. But then the next thing is th- th- we've got to have the blessing of God. If, there's going to, if everyone's going to be satisfied and there's going to be leftovers, we've got to have the blessing of God. So he order, orders everybody to get out of the grass. And then taking the five loaves and the two fish, he looks up to heaven and said, A blessing. Again, he's, he's training his disciples. He took what the disciples had given him and he looked up to the Father and said a blessing. See, f- friends, that is so critical. Again, what, did you have, what do you have that you did not receive? Whatever you've received, you give it back to God and he will add his blessing. And so without the blessing of God, Five loaves of bread and two fish are going to remain five loaves of bread and two fish. But with the blessing of God, miraculously, five loaves of bread and two fish divide and divide and divide until everyone is satisfied and there's leftovers. So there's one more part here, though. At the end of verse 19... It says, after saying the blessing, that he broke the loaves and gave them to the disciples, and the disciples gave them to the crowds. Now, push pause on that for just a moment. If you remember from the account in the Old Testament, the children of Israel wandering in the wilderness and being out in this desert place, that many hundreds of thousands of people, there's no way for them to grow any crops or to catch enough Game, you don't catch game, you kill it, I know. It, you, could har- you could say harvest. But there's no way for them to meet all of their needs. They just don't have what they need. And so God provides them manna from heaven. And it just showed up every day. They would go out in the morning and they would be on the f- ground. This, just these, this flaky bread-like stuff. And God provided for them like that day after day after day for years. And so we think, well, that's how God's done it. And so maybe that's how he's going to do it again. Take these five loaves of bread and take these two fish and look toward heaven and say, Father, and say a blessing. And and then all of a sudden, it just kind of comes from heaven. It didn't work like that, did it? That should cause us to go, huh, that's interesting. God did it like that before, but he's doing something different here under the ministry of Christ. Why, why is that? See, here's what we've got to get. Jesus' compassion for others, what we've already noted, Jesus meeting other people's needs because of his compassion always includes his disciples. That's why even when he wanted to get away by himself, he wasn't by himself, he was with his disciples. He wasn't all alone. His disciples are with him. And so he's training them. He's wanting them and us to understand that when he wants to show compassion to others, he includes his disciples in that process of showing compassion. We don't, we're, we're, we haven't grasped it fully if we, if we only see Jesus in this text as this famous provider. He fed 5,000. He did feed 5,000. And in the process, what God had blessed was distributed through the disciples to the crowds. And again, as we're growing in Christ, we need his compassion to offset 
our own personal desires. We need to take what we have, what we've been given to by God, and give it back to God so He can add His blessing. And then when He gives it back to us, we distribute it to others. All of that is necessary. All of that is part of what it means to follow Jesus. So we don't want to just see him as this famous provider like, wow, Jesus does miracles. We have to also see that we are part of his distribution team. What Jesus has given to us, whether it's skills or resources or money, etc., we need God's blessing on it, and we need to be a part of his meeting of other people's needs. It's part of his compassion. Now, here's the last couple of thoughts here are interesting to me because there's leftovers. You think, why why are there leftovers? And I know some of you have an aversion to leftovers. I think think leftovers are wonderful. I I like leftovers. Um, But everybody ate. And again, when we read the other accounts of this same story, It says they ate as much as they wanted, which means the disciples are, they're like playing waiters. They're, oh, oh, this this group of 50 needs more bread. Let's go get them more bread. And oh, they need more fish. And let's get them more fish. And this group of 100, same thing. They, They had as much as they wanted. They all ate and were satisfied. And there's leftovers? I think, why, why is that? Why would we, why do we need that in here? Isn't it enough to just see Je- to say Jesus met all of their needs because he's compassionate? Why are there leftovers? See, I'm intrigued by these things. I, I have to interrogate the, the text here and go, what, why is this? And here, here's my conclusion. And you, prob- you might have a conclusion as well. Here's my conclusion. Because Jesus wants his disciples, and probably the crowd too, He wants these people who have experienced this event, he wants them to know that the God he's calling them to serve, the God he's calling them to love and to serve with their whole lives is a God of abundance and not scarcity. He wants them to know that the God that they are, that he's calling them to give their lives to is a God of plenty that he's a very generous God. Uh, That's my conclusion. But who got the leftovers? That's my other question. I'm like, the text doesn't say who got the leftovers. I want to know these things. It might be the little boy. John says a young boy gave five loaves, two fish. Maybe, Maybe... Maybe Jesus got all those disciples to grab those 12 baskets of bread and fish and brought it to that little boy and said, there you go, buddy. I don't know. Maybe. You know what I actually think? I think the disciples got it. Now, in a few weeks, we're going to find the account of the feeding of the 4,000, and the math isn't the same. The feeding of the 4,000, that there's not 12 baskets left over. There's leftovers but not 12 baskets, so it doesn't, it doesn't hold consistent. But in this setting, there are 12 disciples who are part of Jesus' distribution team, and, and there are 12 baskets full, baskets full left over. So that's, it's speculation, and, so I, and I readily admit that. It's, if it was in the text, I would say this is in the text. But we're just trying to figure it out. Why, but we're told they're there. I think that Jesus gave them to the disciples. And here's why I think that, because it would be consistent with how God blesses those who serve him well. He blesses. When it says all ate and were satisfied, I don't think it's just the crowd. I think it's the disciples are a part of the all. They also were satisfied. So I, I again, maybe, but this passage is teaching us, friends. It's a very familiar passage, but it's teaching us. We need to see Jesus' compassion offsetting his own personal desires, and we need to learn that. We need to see that Jesus got his disciples to finally bring what they had to him 
because he needed to add the blessing. And we need to learn that. And we need to learn that when we do this, when we work in the way Jesus is training us, everyone's satisfied and there's leftovers. And that's a good place for us to be in, friends. So why, back to the original question, why, of all of the miracles, why is this one in the Scriptures? Why is this one recorded four times in each of the, uh, four times in the Gospels, right? And I believe it, it's, it's how, what, how I'm stating it is our big idea. I believe it's this. With Jesus, whatever we have is more than enough. I, I believe that that's why this passage is recorded all four times, because there's something very critical for us to understand as followers of Christ. And if you're not a follower of Christ, it's, un, it's very important for you to understand in considering becoming one of his followers that with Jesus, whatever you have is more than enough because of who he is, not because of what you have or who you are, but because of who he is. Whatever you have is more than enough. It's the same sentiment the Apostle Paul, when he wrote to the Philippians, thanking them for their generosity toward him as he's in prison for the sake of the gospel, and they've supplied his needs, and he thanks them. And he confesses, I know what it's like to have a little, and I know what it's like to have a lot, and I've learned the secret of being content, and that is that I can do all things through Christ who gives me strength. So whatever you have, whether it's a little or whether it's a lot, with Jesus, it's enough, friends. And that's an important thing for us to grasp as his followers. So we'll call that our big idea for the day. Jesus is not limited by a little if it's offered to him. The little we have when brought in faith to him are the ingredients for a great miracle. So let's talk about ways that we can respond. First, if you're, let's say, a part of the crowd that has not, you're, 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 getting familiar with Jesus, you're, you're learning a little bit about him, but you're a part of the crowd that has not yet put your trust in him. I believe this miracle is meant to teach you that Jesus cares about you and that he will care for you, just like he did in this, in this account. He cared about that crowd. He had compassion for them. And in caring about them, he cared for them. So if you're not a follower of Christ, you've not yet put your trust in him, he cares about you, and he will care for you. So trust him and become one of his followers today. You receive him by faith. It's a simple acknowledgement that you need God's grace and forgiveness and that you want Jesus to be your Savior and your Lord. Now, if you're one of his disciples, I think that you are already learning that he cares about you and will care for you. You're already learning that. You're already knowing that. And the reminder's nice, but I think there's something else here too. I think that this miracle here is meant to teach you what to expect as you follow him. I think what you can expect is as Jesus has compassion for others, he wants you to have compassion for others. So you can expect to, at times, subordinate your own wants to a greater cause. Again, the passage from Philippians that we read is, it doesn't say that our interests are insignificant. It simply says others are important also. So expect to subordinate your wants to the needs of others. Expect to be expected to care for others. The disciples, tired as they were, were expected to stay on their feet and continue to labor. And that's a worthy expectation because we can also expect Jesus to use our efforts. As tired as they were, Jesus was using their efforts. And we could probably say the same at times. That's a pretty... Um, talking, talking about being satisfied, that's a very satisfying sense to know that you've been useful to God. Is there anything better? 
I think we can expect Jesus to multiply our efforts. That we do what we can with what we have, but he adds his blessing and friends, then we see the real miracle. And we can expect Jesus to show his generosity to us as his disciples. It's meant to teach us what to expect when we follow him. So, as a follower of Jesus, I'm going to compel you to make some commitments this morning. Some of you have already made these commitments and it will be a reiteration. You'd say, yes, I'm reinforcing that. Others, maybe it's time. Commitment number one, I will allow compassion for others to offset my own wants. Notice I just said yes or no. It's not on a continuum. Like, yeah, I'll do that 55% of the time. It's yes or no. And you're not going to live that out in perfection because you're still a human being and you still have, you know, that selfishness and all of that. But you're committed to it. You're saying, Lord, this is really what I want. This is what I'm committing myself to. Allow your compa- my compassion for others to offset my own wants. Number two is I will bring what I have to him and whatever that might be. Your talents, your skills, your goods, your resources. I think tithing is a part of that. Offerings are a part of that. Hey, even something as simple as the the anything auction would be a part of that. How how are we going to build a a church, a mid-sized church like City Point Church is, how are we going to build a building that's going to serve this community, this church and this community for the next 75 years? How are we going to do that? Building, I mean, we're talking some multi-million dollar project. Well, it's going gonna, it's gonna to happen because we're going to do what we can and God's going to do what we can't. But if we don't do what we can, the five loaves and the two fish needed to be brought to Jesus. So even something as simple as the anything auction. Some of you are like, oh, yeah, cute video, and then it's out of mind. Figure out what you're going to bring to the anything auction and do it this week. I brought my golf clubs. I'm not a big golfer, and I thought, I'm donating those. I'll rent them if I ever golf again, right? Number three, commitment number three, I will anticipate God's abundance, and that's faith. That's where faith comes in. I'm going to anticipate God's abundance as I live out commitments one and two. Yes or no? I'm going to believe God for some things. All right. So I'm going to pray, and then I'm going to leave you to decide how you're going to respond to this message. As the team plays, you can remain seated. And at the appropriate time, Allison will have you stand and close in prayer, but, or close the, the gathering. But let me, let me pray. Our good Lord, we thank you for your faithfulness. Thank you for this story that's recorded in all four of your Gospels, Lord. And we pray that you will teach us your ways. I pray for this congregation, Lord, those who are listening online, those who are here in the auditorium, I pray that you will teach us your ways, Lord. May your compassion be our compassion. May we bring to you what you have already blessed us with. And may you add your blessing to it, Lord, that all may be satisfied. And may there be leftovers, Lord. I pray that you will guide each one In these moments, Lord, how you would have them to respond. That we might be doers and not just hearers of your word. We love you, Lord. Amen.